Hello, and welcome to this, the fifth episode of uh, the Wittgenstein's Reading Group. Um, yeah, there's... Oh, I can hear myself in the background. <laughs> so Ian Mills isn't going to be joining us today, even though he's been a staple of the episode so far. But he will be back. But he's just not here this week. Uh, the join link, if anyone does want to join in, um, feel free to do so. That's there. We've put the link out to a few places. So it's the link is on Discord and Twitter. So potentially someone else might join in a bit. But I don't know that I'm that optimistic because sometimes it is just me in these ones. Started out with about five people, though. But it's kind of difficult to just to coordinate it, I think, with um, all the different times and stuff that people operate at. It's something that's going as well over on for so long, over so many weeks, that I think people can kind of just fizzle out and have different, um, different schedules and stuff. Okay, so I'm just getting something up that might be useful for... Um, For while we do this, scroll down to what I'm looking at is a book that is a commentary and has some useful things to say in case there's any weird points that we get stuck on. And I'm trying to find the part in the commentary. And I think I'm around about there. Yeah, that seems about right. Okay, let's see. Oh, Ian is here. Hey, Ian. <laughs> hey, Nathan. How's it going? I didn't think you were joining me today, so. <laughs> I didn't think I was either. I have, and I won't be able to stay for terribly long. Uh, we're going to be traveling a little bit uh, later today, so. Anyone nice? Holiday? Uh, work? No, we're going to pick up my little sister from the airport, shore around the area, and then we're going to head to a small town right. out in the mountains uh, for a bit. So nice. That stuff. sounds good, though. Yeah, yeah, be good. Yeah. Where are we in the um, investigations? Yeah, so I, I I've got a a separate bookmark in there now for our where we were up to. So I think we got we stopped at about thirty six last time, and I'm hoping we'll be able to make a bit more. Um, progress today. So I'm happy just to get started, basically. And if anyone does want to join at any point, you know, feel free to just click the link and join in. Even if you've not done so in the past, you're more than welcome. Uh, so I'll start with section 36 then. Uh, and we do hear what we do in a host of similar other cases, because we cannot specify any one bodily action, which we call pointing at a shape, as opposed to the color, for example. We say that a mental spiritual activity corresponds to these words where our language suggests a body, and there is none, and there is none, there, we should like to say, is a spirit. And so, I mean, devoid of context, this is going to be a little bit difficult for those who are here for the first time. And so to put to situate that right in some context, um, Wittgenstein's been talking about ostensive definitions. So that is definitions where you kind of like point at things. And the picture theory, which he's opposing, I suppose, would talk about propositions as being these kind of like mental mental entities. So so the idea in the picture theory might be that when someone points at something and talks about it, that there's this kind of like mental entity that's a representation of that thing or something like that. And Wittgenstein has been kind of like opposing this through a series of um, not so much arguments as kind of like illustrations that he sort of gives. And, you know, they, they kind of just unsettle the the, th the story that you might have been telling yourself about what's going on in those situations. Um, yeah, absolutely. The particular claim he's making at 36 is just that when you're trying to teach someone the color blue and you point at a blue object, there's no way for them to know what aspect of the thing you're pointing at, right? That's just the, the claim of 36, right? This is a gavaga. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Gavaga is a quine. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Yep. 
so so I, th I think one i mean he i think he talks about this explicitly in some places so it might be worth going through but i, th I think the point that he's trying to raise is maybe you know someone could raise the objection well when i try to teach someone what blue is you know i point at things that are blue but i'm sort of trying to like produce in them the same mental concept that i have in my mind when when um i do that and i think i think he's sort of divorcing the the idea of the mental entity from the linguistic practice by saying um you know it's kind of underdetermined what someone means by that but there's just this set of like public actions that accompany it and i think he talk, talks about like you know someone could trace their finger around the edge but have like a different thing in mind um Yep, I on. agree with your characterization of the overall project, absolutely. Or not overall project, but like what he's doing in these in these sections, for sure. He's trying to problematize extensive definition and also this particular picture theory of language. Yeah, um, agreed. Should we move on? Yeah, let's do it. Do you want to go 37? I, mean, I guess actually, before we move on, what is that last sentence doing? Because I'm not sure I have any idea. <laughs> What's the spirit bit? <laughs> I mean, what Geist in German, I suppose, might not as clearly be spirit because it sort of comes with a lot of philosophical baggage. But um, yeah, I, th I think maybe it's, I think it's more pejorative. It's sort of like when someone like Patricia Churchland does something today in philosophy says, you know, no spooky mental stuff or whatever. I, th I think spirit is being used pejoratively to sort of say, well, when you know, when, when you sort of theorize in, in the way that's been done previously about what's going on here, when we point at things and this kind of like mental language that's occurring, we sort of postulate these um, kind of spooky type entities. And and I, I Wittgenstein, want to say there isn't any need for any of that kind of stuff in, in what's going on. It's all laid out before us. Okay, I'll buy that. Um, I think, I think what that's is, what's going on. Uh, yeah, no, it's yeah. as plausible as I anything I can offer. I was just like this, I find, found that kind of puzzling. Uh, what is the relation between name and thing named? Well, what is it? Look at the language game. Uh, and he's pointing us back to section two, is that right? Or at some other, so. or at some other one. That's where one can see what this relation may consist in. Among many other things, this relation may also consist in the fact that hearing a name calls before our mind, sorry, that hearing a name calls before our mind the picture of what is named. And sometimes in the names being written on the thing named, or and sometimes, <laughs> I'm having a hard time uh, with the intonation here, and sometimes in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the names being, no, in the names being written on the thing named, or in its being uttered when the thing named is pointed at. That was rough. So yeah, he, so he's talked about extensive definitions, and now he's moving on to names. And there's a bunch of philosophy around like names and the way that they work. That he's gonna kind of he's kind of gonna again resist these tr traditional um, conceptualizations of of what names are and how they work. Um, so, so what's he saying here? He's saying there are three things that you might imagine happen when you mention a name. And that is the thing that's named, you might imagine that the thing, the picture of the thing appears in your mind. You might imagine that the thing, the name is written on the thing, or you might imagined, might have imagined right. that uh, the thing being pointed at while the thing is being uttered. So those are three things you might imagine right. is happening to connect a name to the thing named, right? Right. Yeah, I think that's I mean, right. So, because because one of those sounds sort of like... Um, you know, like kind of like Russell's um, internalist kind of description theory, you know, like a description that you've got in mind or like a, a kind of tagging theory or something, I think, uh, is talking tagging about in particular and seems wanted... to be, yeah. Tagging um, seems to be what he's talking about. And the yeah. thing and the thing being pointed at, it, it's being uttered when the thing named is pointed at seems maybe like it's getting a, like a million sense of names or something like that. Like it's the thing itself, you know, that's in your mind or something. Maybe. Oh. I, I, maybe I was thinking extensive right definition again. Yeah. He's going to critique all these three things, right? These are just, he, he says, you might, you might imagine this is how a name connects to a thing is the mental image, the extensive definition. Right. It points or, out the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Or tagging. Yeah. Uh, but what, for example, does the word this name in language game eight or the word that in extensive explanation? 
that is called so and so. If you don't want to produce confusion, then it is best not to say that these words name anything. Yet, strange to say, the word this has been called the real name, so that anything else we call a name was only in an inexact, approximate sense. This odd conception springs from a tendency to sublimate the logic of our language, as one might put it. The proper answer to, to it is, we call very different things names. The word name serves to characterize many different, variously related kinds of use of a word. But the kind of use of a word this, ha the, the kind of use that the word this has, is not among them. It is quite true that in giving an extensive definition, for instance, we often point to the object named and utter the name. And likewise, in giving an extensive definition, we utter the word this while pointing to a thing. And also the word this and a name often occupy the same position in the context of a sentence. But it is precisely characteristic of a name that it is explained by means of the de demonstrative expression, that is n, or that is called n. Uh, but, but do we also explain that is called this, this is called this. This is connected with the conception of naming as a process that is, so to speak, a cult. Naming seems to be a strange connection of a word with an object, and such a strange connection rarely obtains, particularly when a philosopher tries to fathom the relation between name and what is named by staring at an object in front of him and repeating a name or even the word this innumerable, innumerable times. For philosophical problems arrive when language goes on holiday, and then we may indeed imagine naming to be some remarkable mental act, as it were the baptism of an object, and, and we can also say the word this to the object, as it were address the object as this, a strange use of this word, which perhaps occurs only when philosophizing. Quite a lot going on there. It's it's difficult to think about as well while reading it, so I'm gonna have to uh, go back to the start and think. For sure. So it seems yeah. it seems like he he talks about um, terms like this and that, for example, is clearly not being the same as names. Seems to be one of the first observations that he makes. I wonder if at the beginning he's responding to an account of language that where he says that this is like the what is it called the the real the only real name. <laughs> um, if right. He's responding to a count of language that just sees language as sort of foundationally ostensive, like that language all develops out of sort of ostensive definitions. I'm not sure who I would like associate yeah. that idea with. Da I um, think David. I think Davidson, but Davidson's later than Wittgenstein. But I, I was going to say there's something wrong there with our timeline. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Davidson probably <laughs> yeah. is drawing on some somebody that Wittgenstein knows. Um, really, Davidson says that. That's really interesting. I think I think he might say that. Yeah, I think I think it's him that says um, that extensive definitions are the only. But I, I mean, I could be wrong about that as well. Sure, no, just no making worries. it up. But that's what I've got in my mind. <laughs> I mean, I get. Yeah, I mean, I suppose so, someone's saying Russell in the chat, and it could be Russell as well, because obviously Russell's definite descriptions are internal, but for him, um, other nouns that don't, aren't accompanied by the definite article. Would be um, sort of yeah they're, they're sort of like what well, well they're million in it I suppose it maybe it's just like million names in a sense um, where it sort of points to the thing. Want to explain um, that concept? Yeah, or Augustine. So the the idea of a million name is going to be that. Um, that is if a name you, if you take like a, as a noun. proposed by John Stuart Mill, right? Just to be clear, you're not saying million yeah, as right. in the number. Yeah, okay. yeah it's it, yeah, it's called million as a you know, like it, but he's not the only person that sort of held that view as well. There's pl plenty of people who have held held a view um that's sort of like it. It's just something that philosophers say. And the idea is that, you know, the content of a name is the thing that it denotes, right? So um if you say Dartmouth, you know, the the place Dartmouth. Then you actually what that word what that word means is the place Dartmouth, um, and in a sense that can sort of be reduced to extension, I guess, because and I think that the outside of definite descriptions, which for Russell, rather so like the present king of France or something, right? Rather than that denoting a person, that's about a, a description that I have in my mind, 
and then some it's true just in case some object in the world satisfies that description but um but these other sort of nouns are different because they they just sort of directly have the content of the thing named in their head so i guess it's against that sort of view and what's his response to it here does he actually give us one or does he just indicate that he's not gonna like this with his use of adjectives like strange We're saying if if you look at the words devoid of context, I think, um, well, what are you going to say that this and that denote? You know, like it without without pointing to anything and saying this, but just the word this, like what what does that name? Right, um, I think is his first sort of question. That's and right. One of his critiques. So good. Yeah. No, I was just going to leap on that, which is just to say that one of his critiques seems to be right at the end of the uh, second paragraph that. How did you teach someone what this means? Did you point at this and say this? Um, which seems like not a very interesting right. critique, but I, maybe it gets to maybe it gets to a deeper point, which is this can only be. Is he making some sort of argument that like the the word this can only be used ostensibly within a language game, within a form of life that you've already learned how people use this? I mean, is that is that the critique he's implying? I mean, I, mean, he I think that's out. a point he he makes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that if that's explicitly being made here, but I do think that that's what was sort of raised, made, you know, like when he was talking about the chess pieces and the board being laid out before in that in some of the previous sections. But uh, well, yeah, when he was saying, you know, you could only sort of teach someone how to move the piece around if they already understood like a bunch of stuff. So maybe we're lacking a bit of a bit of context for some of those things. I'm, I was really surprised to see the language on holiday introduced into this section uh, because I've always associated that with other other um, parts of Wittgenstein than this section. Um, but it's hard to even, I'm not entirely sure what it's what it's doing here. Um, that I mean, his claim that philosophical problems arise when language goes on holiday makes sense to me as part of his later critique of, you know, his later what we call metaphilosophy, his later philosophy that in the same book, um, but I don't see how that works as a critique of ostensive definition. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think, I think, so yes, the question there, but do we also explain that is called this, you know, like the word this, or this is called this. So, so I think that's just reiterating the points we sort of drew out, um, earlier. And then, yeah, he says, this is, so when he says this is connected with the conception of naming is a process that is, so to speak, a cult. Uh, naming seems to be a strange connection of a word with an object. So I, th I think this is, so, so what does he mean here? I think it's something like on these sort of theories of language of what's going on in reference, then it, it is sort of weird, you know, how, how, like I was just talking about Dartmouth before, right? What, but it's sort of weird like that there's some connection between on this theory, the word me saying the word Dartmouth and the place Dartmouth, like as if it it somehow references that place, and then you know where does that happen or how does that happen? And I think that's what he's saying is like some sort of occult um, process. Naming seems to be a strange connection of a word to an object, and such a strange connection really obtains. Um, particular, and then this is the critique of philosophy starting to come in, particularly when a philosopher tries to fathom the relation between name and what is named by staring at an object in front of him and repeating a name, or even the word this innumerable times. Um, and then, yeah, he's, so, so then to say, Philosophical problems arise when our language goes on holiday. So I think I can't remember the exact context of the preceding passages as well as to why he might be introducing that here. But I think um, obviously he talked previously about language, you know, like doing doing work, language being like a, a city that's been built up over time and do, or doing work you know, like a, like a gear does in an engine things. He, he's used sort of metaphors of this kind and so the idea of language going on holiday is sort of, again, it's per pejorative in a sense because I suppose it, it it connotes the idea that while language is on holiday, it's not it's not actually doing anything like it does in our ordinary practices, but um, but while it's there, you know, we we obviously get confused because it's not doing what it should be doing. It's an idling kind of gear there. 
Right. I've always thought about this phrase. I, we're gonna. I think we're gonna come across this again later. And we talked about it in like our first or second uh, Wittgenstein study. But the idea that language develops in a neighborhood for a particular purpose for particular projects, and then philosophical problems often arise when you try to take that language and apply it to something for which it wasn't developed, for which in a context in which no one would use that word, um, how it was created to be used um, in the speech communities that use it. Um, but I don't. I. Other than just being a sort of jab at philosophical attempts to explain the mystical union between words and objects, I don't see what it's doing a lot of like analytic work here, or I, like, I don't understand totally how it's fitting here. Your right. explanation seems as good so, as anything. So he says, I'm not criticizing, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I don't. I, I mean, I, I am sort of just um, trying to make sense of it as well. I, I, I've not thought about this much. Well, I probably at, at a previous point in time, like might have understood this and then I've just forgotten or something, but um. So then uh, towards the end here, he, and then he says, and then we may indeed imagine naming to be some remarkable mental act, as it were, the baptism of an object. And we can also say that the word, uh, and we can also say the word this to the object, as it were, address the object as this, um, a strange use of this word, which perhaps occurs only when philosophizing. So, so again, establish I think, I think the Wittgenstein is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say it. I, I think he's just pointing out the weirdness of that relation, like or or how how um different these theories of analyses that might be given relating, you know, words or extension or whatever to things are from our actual use of them, I think is his point here. I was just gonna say we've already established that he's a time traveler to critique Dennett. Now he's attacking Kripke. Right uh, in the in the future. <laughs> Um, no, I, I agree. I agree with that analysis. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, I I think it's another attempt, like reference to the occult. Like it's like it's a cult or like it's spiritual. He's saying like, how does this work? Maybe you baptize objects, right? He's not he's not actually criticizing the kind of thing Kripke says, which is a, a historical story for how names assigned to things in our language, right? Right. I I think so. Um... I mean, obviously, I, I do find this kind of weird because Kripke's obviously, oh, I mean, he wrote a book about Wittgenstein and private language. And he even talks about in Naming and Necessity, the um, whether the meter is a meter or whatever thing that Wittgenstein says and uh, whether whether like a meter is necessarily a meter. And yeah, I don't, I don't really understand how Kripke does get around this accusation of his theory being a cult. Um, I guess he wants to say it's natural because there's this... Um, Maybe he'd say that this like baptism process is the coinage of a term and a linguistic community just begins to use it in a certain kind of way. And then there is this, you know, purely historical, natural process of people, uh, you know, between that original coinage event and people adopting the, the term in future. So maybe it's not it's not quite um, as a cult. But yeah, I do find it kind of strange um, that Kripke is sort of aware of this, but doesn't kind of make clear whether he's responding to something that, or like deliberately using the the terminology from I, I don't know maybe there's more there yeah i just think Wittgenstein's doing something criticizing something different than kripke is actually claiming maybe i don't know should i keep reading yeah keep it keep reading by all means but why does it occur to, to one to want to make precisely this word into a name when it obviously is not a name that is just the re that is just the reason. Period. For one is tempted to make an objection against what is ordinarily called a name. It can be put like this: a name ought really to signify a simple. Is this Tractatus? Uh, and one might perhaps I think so, give yeah. yeah. And one might perhaps give the following reasons for this: the word no thung. Am I reading this right? <laughs> is this a yeah, uh, yeah. It sounds weird because it sounds like it should be nothing, but it's. I but think it's, it's the name of a sword or something. Right? Okay. Um, the word no thung, say, is a proper name in the ordinary sense. The sword no thung consists of parts combined in a particular way. If they are combined differently, no thung does not exist. But it is clear that the sentence no thung has a sharp blade has a sense, whether no thung is still whole or has already been shattered. But if no thung is the name of an object, this object no longer exists when no thung is shattered into pieces. And as no object would then correspond to the name, it would have no meaning. 
But then the sentence, no thunk is a sharp blade, would contain a word that has no meaning, and hence the sentence would be nonsense. But it does have a sense, so there must be something corresponding to the words of which it consists. So the word no thing must disappear when the sense is, is analyzed, when the sense is analyzed, and its place be taken by words which name symbols. It will be reasonable to call these words the real names. So, this I mean this yeah, is that's a difficult. Uh, <laughs> or this is a critique of uh, making meaning into denotation, right? Like you can do a similar thing with Hesper and Vespera, right? This is the the idea that you know unicorns have one horn is true even though there are no unicorns is that some similar move he's making here i i think it's similar to that but i think i think a part a key part of it in my understanding is it, in his original like his original um tractatus theory this idea of there being sort of like atomic facts which make up the world that are that, you know that that are kind of like denoted and then put into complexes to make pictures um which are described in, in in propositions and so forth. Um, so I, th I think that's a part of his criticism, but I haven't I haven't quite fully understood it to be honest. Um, so a name, oh, a name. Nathan, unfortunately, I have to drop symbol. out. So uh, I'll. Yeah, no problem. My apologies. Okay. Talk to you soon. Yeah, <laughs> hope you have a good time. See you in a bit. Um, okay, everyone. If if you are hanging around in the chat and want to join, there's the join link. So um, feel free to. Let me see if I can figure something out. Uh, whether the, there's not quite how you take the definition with how you go. It merely says that we can see the former in the latter. how you take the definition. So we take how you take the definition to mean no more or less than how you want to use the word. Yeah, I'm not gonna dwell on, on that passage because I've clearly not entirely got it. But the next one about Mr. NN being dead, let's see if we can make a bit more sense of that. Um, let me see. So section 40, let us first discuss the following point in an argument, that a word has no meaning if nothing corresponds to it. It is important to note that it is a solecism to use the word meaning to signify the thing that corresponds to a word. That is to confound the meaning of a name with the bearer of a name. When Mr. N. N. dies, one says that the bearer of the name dies not that the meaning dies. And it would be nonsensical to say this, for if the name ceased to have a meaning, it would make no sense to say, Mr. NN is dead. So that's more clearly to me against the million theory of names, right? Um, because if the, if the meaning of the name just is the thing that it denotes, then when, when he dies, you would have to say, um, the name of the thing died. Uh, sorry, when, when he dies, you would have to you'd have to say, yeah, the word Mister NN died, or the meaning of NN N. dies. The bearer of the name dies, not the meaning dies. The meaning doesn't die when the bearer dies. In section fifteen, we introduced proper names into language eight. Um, I think language eight was slab block. I think. Now suppose that that, or it might not have been. Maybe maybe I'm just misremembering. Now suppose that the tool with the name N is broken. Not knowing this, A gives B the sign N. Has this sign a meaning now or not? What is B to do when he is given it? We haven't settled anything about this. One might ask, what will he do? Well, perhaps he will stand there at a loss or show A the pieces. Here, one might say. N has become meaningless. And this expression would mean that the sign N no longer had a use in our language game, unless we gave it a new one. N might also become meaningless because for whatever reason, the tool was given another name and the sign N no longer used in the language game. 
but we could also imagine a convention whereby B has to shake his head in reply if A gives the sign for a tool that is broken. In this way, the command N might be, might be said to be admitted into the language game even when the tool no longer exists, and the sign N to have meaning even when its bearer ceases to exist. So I think here, let me just see if anyone else has tried to join or anything. Yeah, so I think I think here basically what's happening is Wittgenstein's fleshing out um, how these sorts of nouns work in his proposed version of how language works, right, in, in language games. So I think the language in eight was that there's two workers and one calls like slab and block and things like that, and the other one brings him things. So he says, suppose that the tool with the name N is broken. So the first person A, who's making the calls to B, get, you know, gives him the sign N. And Wittgenstein's asking the question, well, now, does this does this sign have, have meaning anymore now that the tool is broken, now that now that it can't perform the same use that it was doing before? I mean, what's B to do when he's given this sign? Well, he could stand there at a loss. Um, he could show A the pieces of the broken tool. And in this case, in this case where the tool is broken and A asks B, gives B the sign for the tool, someone might say N has become meaningless because it no longer fulfills its function, right? Its use in that language game anymore. And this expression would mean that the sign N no longer had a use in our language game. So yeah, so for, for something to be meaningless means for it to not have a use in the language game unless we give it a new one. N might also become meaningless because for whatever reason, the tool was given another name and the sign N no longer used in the language game. But we could also imagine a convention whereby B has to shake his head and reply if A gives a sign for a tool that is broken. So, so I think Wittgenstein's account here is sort of showing um, how the use of the same symbols or the, sa the same names or whatever actually changes within our linguistic activities. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be any of these ways in the, um, in the language game between A and B, but plausibly, or not even plausibly, I mean, possibly, it could be any of these ways, right? Um, and all they would be doing is establishing a new set of practices by which they use N in these different ways. Okay. Section 42. But have even names, have even names that have never been used for a tool got a meaning in that game? Let's assume that X is such a sign and that A gives this sign to B. Well, even such signs could be admitted into the language game, and B might have to answer them with the shake of, of the head. One could imagine this as a kind of amusement for them. Yeah, so, so he's saying, what about, what about names that have never been used uh, to, to... Names that have never been used by A to get B to bring them a tool? Do those have a meaning in the game? Well, let's assume that X is one of those. A says to be X. Well, even these signs, right? E these signs which don't function any way in the same way that the other ones do, because there's no tool that's brought. And if there isn't, you know, if the tool is broken or whatever, there's not like a shaking of the head or whatever that goes on. Well, they, they can still perform a different, like, variegated form of language game between A and B. I mean, and, and this could be like an amusement language game or a joke or something where um, A gives the sign X to B and B shakes his head. And, and the the butt of the joke here, I think, is like almost as if it were a proper name, but it's actually not, you know, it, it, it's not a name. It doesn't function in the same way that those other names do, even though it sort of looks maybe like it should. And that's the, that's the butt of the joke here. Okay, section 43. For a large class of cases of the employment of the word, 
let me start again. For a large class of cases of the employment of the word meaning, though not for all, this word can be explained in this way. The meaning of a word is its use in, a, in the language. And the meaning of a name is sometimes explained by pointing to its bearing. So I think something important to note about this um, sort of famous, or not famous, but important part of the investigations is that Wittgenstein is saying for a large class of cases of the employment of the word meaning. So meaning is how we use the words, but he's saying that it's not, it's not the case for all words, but for the vast majority of words, it's how we use them. And the meaning of a name is sometimes explained by pointing to its bearer. And notice that that, okay, so this is interesting. The meaning of a name is sometimes explained by pointing to its bearer. Isn't a theory about occult processes of denoting, right? But it's a description of what takes place. Okay, that's, that's, in, that's the interesting shift. Because he's saying, well, what, what, are ne what, do, what is naming, right, in, in our linguistic practices? Well, the meaning of a name is sometimes explained by pointing to its bearer. And that's just a description of what people do, right? It's just look and see what people do when um, asked for the meaning of a name. And they go, you know, this is a pen or something. I think that's the point there. Okay. Um, I don't know what the hell's going on in the chat, right? It seems like the things that you're saying are completely off topic. Um, just so you know, I don't appreciate that. Okay, section 44. We said that the sentence, no thung has a sharp blade, has a sense even when no thung is already shattered. Well, this is so because in this language game, a name is also used in the absence of its bearer. So what do you Okay, I'm just going to pause at that point and say, and say okay, that makes sense. In, in our language games, we, we use names even when their bearers cease to exist. But we can imagine a language game with names, that is, with signs which we would certainly call names, which we would certainly call names, in which they are used only in the presence of the bearer, and so could always be replaced by a demonstrative pronoun and a pointing gesture. So he means, you know, this. The demonstrative this can never be without a bearer. It might be said, so long as there is a this, the word this has meaning too, what, whether this is simple or complex. But that does not make the word into a name. On the contrary, for a name is not used with, but only expa explained by means of a pointing gesture. Okay, 46 what lies behind the idea that names really signify symbols. Socrates says in the Theaetetus, if I am not mistaken, I have heard some people say this, there is no explanation of the primary elements, so to speak, out of which we and everything else are composed. For everything that exists in and of itself can be signified only by names. No other determination is possible, either that it is or that it is not. But what exists in and of itself has to be named without any other determination. In consequence, it is impossible to give an explanatory account of any primary element. Since, since for it, there is nothing other than mere naming. After all, its name is all it has. But just as what is composed of primary elements is itself an interwoven structure, so the corresponding interwoven names become explanatory language for the essence of the latter is the interweaving of names. Both Russell's individuals and my objects were likewise such primary elements. So a few things going on here. Um, firstly, I suppose he's talking about how, just how old this particular line that he sees as, um, just how old this particular line of thought, train of thought, um, that he sees as misguided or incorrect goes back in philosophy. So all the way back to Plato's Theaetetus. And then he's saying, you know, this is the same as um, Russell's individuals and his multiple relation theory of judgment, I suppose, or um, 
knowledge by acquaintance and description or something and and his objects in the in the tractatus as such primary elements and he's going to say he's going to go on to say why he thinks such views are confused in section 47 but what are the simple constituent parts of which reality is composed what are the simple constituent parts of a chair the pieces of wood from which it is assembled or the molecules or the atoms simple means not composite and here the point is in what sense composite it makes no sense at all to speak absolutely of the simple parts of a chair again does my visual image of this tree of this chair consist of parts and what are its simple constituent parts Multicoloredness is one kind of compositeness. Another is, for example, that of an open curve composed of straight bits, and a continuous curve may be said to be composed of an ascending and descending segment. If I tell someone without any further explanation, what I see before me now is composite, he will legitimately ask, what do you mean by composite? For there are all sorts of things it may mean. The question is what you see composite makes good sense if it is already established what kind of compositeness, that is, what particular use of the word is in question. If it has been laid down that the visual image of a tree was to be called composite, if one saw not just a trunk but also branches, then the question, is the visual, visual image of the tree simple or composite? And the question, what are its simple constituent parts, would have a clear sense, a clear use. And of course, the answer to the second question is not the branches. That would be an answer to the grammatical question, what are here called constituent parts, but rather a description of the individual branches. But isn't a chessboard, for instance, obviously and absolutely composite? You're probably thinking of it being composed of 32 white and 32 black squares. But couldn't we also say, for instance, that it was composed of the colours black and white and the schema of squares? And if there are quite different ways of looking at it, do you still want to say that the chessboard is absolutely composite? Asking, is this object composite outside a particular game is like what a boy once did when he had to say whether the verbs in certain sentences were in the active or passive voice and who racked his brains over the question whether the verb to sleep, for example, meant something active or passive. We use the word composite and therefore the word simple in an enormous number of different and differently related ways. Is the colour of a square on the chessboard simple, or does it consist of pure white and pure yellow? And is the white simple, or does it consist of the colours of the rainbow? Is this length of two centimetres simple, or does it consist of two parts each one centimetre long? But why not one bit three centimetres long, and one bit one centimetre long measured in the opposite direction? To the philosophical question, is the visual image of this tree composite and what are its constituent parts? The correct answer is, that depends on what you understand by composite. And that, of course, is not an answer to, but a rejection of the question. Okay, an awful lot going on there. Um, oh, Jesus Christ. Um, what a mess in the chat. I'm going to just use my tyrant powers to get rid of things that annoy me. Um, there we go. So yeah. So he's talking about, I, I suppose what he's doing here Sort of similar, sort of similar to before in section forty-three, where he said, um, "And the meaning of a name is sometimes explained by pointing to its bearer." And he slipped out of trying to give a theoretical account of um, words and their reference, and just described what we do. I think something similar is taking place at forty-seven, where it looks to me like he's observing right that this this tendency to talk about simple things and their names and individuals and objects in his previous philosophy, um, he's going to sort of take a step back and look and see what's, what's going on. 
And so he looks at the different uses that there are of, you know, comp of terms like um, composite or um, simple. And he says, you know, there's different, there's diff simply different uses. I mean, I just use simply then, right? There's, there are different uses of these words in different linguistic activities. So then I think there's this critique of what philosophers are doing, where they're looking for the one use of simple or composite, which he says is fundamentally confused. And that is um, this part when he said, and this is one of my favorite quotes, I think, asking, is this object composite outside of a particular game? And it's, wor it's worth noting that game isn't to trivialize, you know, what we do in our linguistic activities. Um, Spielen in German is quite serious. So maybe li linguistic practice, right, is better than language game. Maybe I should try to act outside of a particular practice is like what a boy once did when he said when he had to say whether the verbs in certain sentences were in the active or passive voice and who racked his brains over the question whether the verb to sleep for example meant something active or passive so here in this illustration i think it's really interesting because um firstly he takes us back in our memories maybe to a point where we were learning our linguistic practices for the first time and m maybe in a classroom situation where we've been given some task to train ourselves on about um grammar okay so whether we're, be we're being asked to think whether certain verbs are ac active or passive and then there's this verb to sleep now grammatically if if and here's where the two games come into tension. And here's where what philosophers do is they they sort of try to look for the commonality, right, between the two games. But there's two uses here that come into, into tension because from the point of view of grammar, to sleep is active. But from the point of view of what to sleep means, um, to sleep is obviously passive. Sleeping is a passive activity. And so Wittgenstein is saying, you know, the kind of philosophical confusion that we're in is this kind of confusion where we've got a word that sort of has multiple uses and they seem in in uh tension with one another and what we're trying to do is find you know what's what's common to them and then he brings it back to and then and then he brings it back to um composite in an enormous number of different and differently related ways we, we use composite similarly in an enormous, well, maybe not similarly, we use composite in, in an enormous number of differently different ways. Um, so hunting for its, its essence is kind of going to be a fool's errand, I suppose. Okay, section 48. Let us apply the method of section two to the account, to the account in the Theaetetus. Consider a language game for which the, for which the account is really valid. The language serves to represent combinations of colored squares on a surface. The squares form a chessboard-like complex. There are red, green, white, and black squares. The words of the language are correspondingly RGWB. And a sentence is a sequence of these words. Such sequences describe an arrangement of squares in the order, it, in the following order, I don't know if you can see that, but that's the order right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so if you get a string RRB, GGG, RWW, that's, you know, RRB, GGR, R, sorry, GGG, RWW, uh, like that, which would look like so. Apologies that it's difficult to visualize if you don't necessarily have the text or whatever in front of you. Um, <clears throat> here the sentence is a complex of names to which a complex of elements corresponds. Yeah, so it, so in this case, like the in the previous, um, in the account given in the Theaetetus or in his uh, Tractarian account of uh, complexes of Sachverhalden, um, atomic facts, 
that hang that Zusam and Hangen uh, that hang together. He's saying that well, this this is legitimately like that in the sense that there are these these uh, atomic you know squares and and then sentences legitimately complexes of um, those names put together. So the primary elements are colored squares, but are these simple? I wouldn't know what I could more naturally call a simple in this language game. But under other circumstances, I'd call a monochrome square consisting perhaps of two rectangles or of the elements color and shape composite. But the concept of compositeness might also be extended so that a smaller area was said to be composed of a greater area and another one subtracted from it. Compare the composition of forces, the division of a line by a point outside it. These expressions show that we are sometimes even inclined to conceive of the smaller as the result of a composition of greater parts, and the greater and the greater as the result of a division of the smaller. But I do not know whether to say that the figure described by our sentence consists of four or of nine elements. Well, does the sentence consist of four letters or of nine? And which are its elements? The types of letters or the, the types of letter or the letters? Does it matter which we say so long as we avoid misunderstandings in any particular case? But what does it what does it mean to say that we cannot explain, that is, describe these elements but only name them? Well, it could mean, for instance, that when in a limiting case, a complex consists of only one square, its description is simply the name of the colored square. Here one might say that this easily leads to all kinds of philosophical superstition, that a sign R or B, etc., may sometimes be a word and sometimes a sentence. But whether, whether it is a word or a sentence depends on the situation in which it is uttered or written. For instance, if A has to describe complexes of coloured shapes to B, and he uses the word R by itself, we'll be able to say that the word is a description, a sentence. But if he is memorising the words and their meanings, or if he is teaching someone else the use of the words and uttering them in the course of a sense of teaching, we'll not say that they are sentences. In this situation, the word R, for instance, is not description. One names an element with it. But that is why it would be strange to say here is an element, here that an element can only be named. For naming and describing do not stand on the same level. Naming is a preparation for describing. Naming is not yet a move in a language game. Any more than putting a piece in its place on a chessboard is a move in chess. One may say, with the mere naming of a thing, nothing has yet been done, nor has nor has it a name, nor has it a name except in a game. That was what Frege meant too, when he said that a word has meaning only in the context of a sentence. Trying to make sense of um, this comment. Thinking is about language, and language is a rule following practice, and rule following is a necessarily public business. I'm not sure. I, oh, I think this is in response to. A thread that's going on in the um, in the chat, so I'm going to ignore that. What does it mean to say that we can attribute neither being nor non-being to the elements? One might say, if everything that we call being and non-being consists in the obtaining and non-obtaining of connections between elements, it makes no sense to speak of the being non-being of an element, just as it makes no sense to speak of the destruction of an element if everything that we call destruction lies in the separation of elements. One would like to say, however, that being cannot be attributed to an element, for if it did not exist, one could not even name it. 
and so one could state nothing at all about it. But let us consider an analogous case. There is one thing of which one can state neither that it is one metre long, nor that it is not one metre long, and that is a standard metre in Paris. But this, of course, but this is, of course, not to ascribe any remarkable property to it, but only to mark its peculiar role in the game of measuring with a metre rule. Suppose that samples of colour were preserved in Paris, like the standard metre. So we explain that sepia means the colour of the standard sepia which is kept there hermetically sealed. Then, it will make no sense to state of this sample either that it is this colour or that it is not. We can put it like this. This sample is an instrument of the language by means of which we make colour statements. In this game, it is not something that is represented, but is a means of representation. And the same applies to an element in the language game 48, when we give it a name by uttering the word R. In so doing, we have given that object a role in our language game. It is now a means of representation, and to say if it did not exist, it could have no name, is to say as much and as little as if this thing did not exist, we could not use it in our language game. What looks as if it had to exist is part of the language. It is a paradigm in our game, something with which comparisons are made. And this may be an important observation, but it is nonetheless an observation about our language game, our mode of representation. I'm just seeing how far how far I'm thinking of going. There aren't really appropriate places to stop. So I think I'll probably stop there at section 50 um, and do the same thing again in three weeks time when hopefully more people will want to join. <laughs> Thanks everyone.